Bates Russell. I'm the Information and Maintenance Services Director here at the city. So we handle all the uh, technology uh, and all of the buildings and vehicles. So uh, today we're not going to talk about buildings or vehicles, though. We'll talk about technology. At least I think that's on the agenda. So uh, I have a PowerPoint presentation we'll go through. Uh, of course, uh, in the Q&A or in the chat section, uh, go ahead and ask questions. Make sure you're put, not putting anything too personal in there, like I'm using the password of password one, and is that okay? You know, like, so let's uh, keep it a little bit obfuscated if you can. Uh, in any case, we'll save those till the end or grab them uh, periodically through the meeting. The goal for today is to uh, fill you in on some of the best practices of password management. So uh, how to pick a password, how bad guys can get access to passwords, um, and you know, kind of why we're holding this class. And let's get into it. So let me share my screen. So password security uh, can be frustrating. It can be uh, difficult. It, having a password and having uh, 40 different passwords that you have to constantly manage and change and keep track of and remember, did I use the old one? Did I use the new one? Did I use the one with one at the end? Did I use the one with you know two at the end? Um, how many exclamation marks did I use in this one? Uh, are something that we as a society have to deal with. Um, it's just been a growing concern over years since really you know the use of online technology. Um, so why are we teaching this class today? Why, what's the importance of this class? Well, looking at, you know, several known studies, uh, that are listed there at the bottom in the asterisks, uh, we've found that seniors 65 and older tend to be good targets for people who would like to, uh, steal things, right? So because banking has gone online, because mutual funds have gone online, because it's easy to hide your identity uh, when it's not in person, uh, seniors have become a good target for it. In fact, 73% of uh, seniors at 65 and older are online for their banking, for not just social media, and not just Facebook, not just email, but actually utilizing all the services, which is you know pretty good nation nationally. Uh, it's in the 80s. So for 65 and older, that means like the majority of people are actively using the tools on the internet. But most of the people 75, 65 and older have the greatest accumulation of wealth in the US. Um, so when you combine a lot of uh, people online, a lot of wealth, it becomes a target. Technically, and this came from uh, the FBI research, uh, older users, and they, they quantify older as anyone 50 and older. Uh, older users tend to make more technical mistakes, right? you tend to trust more, in fact, is what the article goes on to say about the, that the person on the other uh, end of the phone, other end of the email, on the other end of the text, on the other end of the chat, is in fact who they are and, and are doing the things they're saying. And uh, this has proven out though, through the Aspen Institute that uh, 65 and older are more likely to use poor password logic. It's hard, it's not, you know, most people 65 and older were born prior to computers being a prominent in-home device, right? And if you were an early adopter, uh, you may not be in this, you know, the, the poor password logic skill set, but uh, studies show that they tend to make more uh, worse password choices or, or choose one password. So we're going to go over what it means to do a good password. We're going to go over what it means to, uh, you know, what, what, what are contents of bad passwords and then common tips, tricks that people do to uh, you know, trick you. Before that, I kind of want to go into a little bit of the hack and fraud uh, metrics. So hacks and fraud uh, online to personal people as well as businesses uh, has just, it's exponentially growing. It is this curve that is taking off. I don't think that's a surprise to anyone. 
if you own a telephone, if you have email, you see attempted fraud all the time. People calling you about your auto warranty, people calling you about the free cruise you wanted, people emailing you, uh, you know, to try to get you to join into whatever. Some, some prince has offered that you're their long lost relative and you owe them, or that they owe you millions of dollars. Uh, so it's just continuing to rise. As more and more life goes online, as more and more businesses, uh, financial institutions uh, are born and live solely online. There are many institutions that are not brick and mortar places. I can't go to uh, a, a bank, right? There's no physical interaction. It's all digital for a lot of new burgeoning businesses. And because of that, when there, where there's money, there's fraud. So uh, 2019, $4.1 billion uh, in breaches, right? So that's how much it cost. Not the remediation, but how much people lost, $4.1 billion. Um, and that is individuals in the first half of 19. And by the time I was writing this, they hadn't gotten to the full 20 metrics uh, yet, but we do have some pieces of that. So, you know, if you're looking at 8 billion, roughly, uh, that's a sizable. And if I'm a bad guy, that's a good market to go after. Uh, not you know, really easy to hide and a lot of money out there for me to get, come get. So in the U.S. in 16, which is the last full year report I could find, uh, U.S. reported $650 million in loss just to seniors, again, 65 and older, uh, $650 million out of their hands, not just on credit cards, not just uh, how much it takes to get back that money, all the effort and time and everything. This is just simply the dollars that were taken out of accounts or shared freely, $650 million in the US. Uh, this year, they're estimating 3 billion. So you can see the increase um, estimation, you know, from 650 million to 3 billion. You can see it's just going up every year more and more. So here's a question I have for you. Um, a common way that hackers get into your account or an account is what's called a brute force attack. And if you ever had, uh, say, a lock, right, that had three numbers on it, and you had forgotten what the lock combination was, one way of going and finding that out, right, is by testing them all. So if it was zero, 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 you check it, it doesn't work. Turn it to one, zero, zero, one, you check it. 002, you check it. So doing that is called a brute force attack. I'm just gonna go through every iteration possible until I finally stumble upon the right thing that unlocks that account. Uh, that would take a while, right? 999 at maximum tries to get into that, that three digit lock. So this is kind of the same concept for online. If anyone has your username, right? Typically, you know, like, like your first name or you know, you're out there, you're putting it in all the time. It's your email account. If they put that in as a username and then they just start running, you know, A, A, B, A, B, C, A, you know, on and on and on. How long, right, do these, you know, th these computers, because they're not doing it themselves, they're not sitting at a computer doing it, they're running a program that's running this. And those can do it much faster than humans, obviously. So question is, is a hacking program, and you can go buy right now, $15, you can go buy this, uh, can guess how many passwords every second. So is it in the hundreds every second? Is it in thousands? Is it in the ten thousands? So the answer is 100 to 400 billion a second. So what can happen is these complex computers, right, that are, that are set just with this program to brute force this uh, can try, instead of trying one lock and failing, they can try thousands of you know, attempts at that same one. Uh, so that thousands of machines attempting that same lock and they can go to 400 billion per second. So that's a lot of guesses that can go in there, which means if you have a simple password, one that is you know three characters long, uh, it's gonna take almost instantaneous amount of time to find that you know, password. So what you're looking for in general is length of password beats complexity. We'll talk about that a little bit later, but the longer the password, the more secure in general. 
So I'm gonna take you to two websites really quick. I'm gonna check you out. So, and I want you to do this on a field trip uh, of yourself. You don't have to do it right now, uh, but we'll get you these uh, websites to go to. One is called, uh, it's how secure is my password? We're gonna to go to this site to find out and you're, you're gonna put in a password. We'll go through it together. And then the other one is a site called Have I Been Pwned? Um, pwned, P-W-N-E-D, is a gaming term, uh, meaning you were uh, you know, beaten, right? You were, it, it, they meant to type in owned, like I owned you in this game, but they typed it in wrong. So it's become a thing of uh, pwned. So uh, high up level Microsoft executive uh, was part of a compromise uh, in you know, a website he was a part of and saw that there was, there was a market out there for uh, people to be able to check and see if their usernames and passwords have been in compromises because they seem like they're coming out all the time and there wasn't like a source of them. So he took it upon himself uh, to charge us no money to do this. He fires up this site and you're able to check and see if you can, if uh, any of your passwords or usernames have been part of a compromise. So we'll take this one at a time. So the how secure is my password? We'll stop sharing here and I'll take it over to that site. So this is security.org. This is a, um, it's paid for by a, a, a service, right? Um, but it is a .org, it is, it is it, they don't charge you to do this. Uh, and they don't record any of the data in here because you're not tying it to your username or anything. Uh, but for instance, if you put in a password in here, it'll tell you how long it would take an average code breaking computer to figure out your password. So if my password was my dog's name, Jill, right? J-I-L-L. -L. Uh, clearly, and I can show it here, like I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you all fictitious passwords, but if it was just my dog's name, and that's one I can remember, uh, it would be cracked almost instantly if somebody knew your username. But every time you add a character on, be it a number, a uh, special character, like a star, asterisk, or um, exclamation mark, or just words, letters, um, it makes it exponentially more difficult to crack. So if I said Jill um, is my dog, which I think is a fairly you know, decent password to type in, meets the minimum of eight characters that most places ask for, uh, it's still going to take computer a day to crack it. Not, you know, that's not really gonna any skin off of anyone's back. They go, if they really want into your stuff a day later, they can get into your account. So you start to, again, uh, add special characters. Let's do an exclamation mark. Oh, adding an exclamation mark took that to 17 years from one day to 17 years. In fact, if I do just a regular letter, it adds a couple weeks on there. But if I add special characters in, it now makes it that much harder. Uh, so now Jill is my dog exclamation mark and takes a computer running a single program 17 years to crack that password. That's fairly good. You can get better, obviously, if you start changing out um, numbers for letters, but that's pretty common. So if I, uh, what, you know, if I put, let's see here, show it to you as we do it. Uh, my password, and I'm going to put a zero in the word, my password. Uh, is, but I'm going to put a one for the I, is uh, Jill, and we'll put it J-I-L-L, -L, right? Just putting that as your password. My password is Jill with a zero, one, a capital. I'm meeting the criteria for a lot of places, but now it's taking a computer 37 billion years uh, to do. So length, even though complexity is good, length beats complexity every time. So what I would say is if you were to go to this, how secure is my password? at security.org um, and maybe try some passwords in there to see which are the ones that, that work. Um, I can show you, uh, um, so that's my, just FYI, that's my personal one that I'm not gonna click the eye and show you, um, but this is my personal one, right? So pretty lengthy, it's gonna take a while to figure it out. Uh, if I'm just a computer run. So when you get a sec, go there and check your passwords and see how quickly they can be identified.
if, and just as a side note, if you choose password, you know, these common ones where, uh, what is your password, right? Well, my password is password. It's gonna take it you know, relatively. They, they try these first. If I did password one, right? They, they're gonna they're gonna find these uh, really simple ones before finding you know obviously stuff that's meaning to you. Later in this presentation, I'll show you the you know a good a good methodology for that. The other side I wanted to show you was the have I been pwned? So uh, again, this is uh, breaches happen all the time, right? Uh, Home Depot, Target, uh, countless websites, banks credit unions, uh, the credit reporting agencies, Experian, you hear about them almost, uh, well, almost daily at this point, but certainly large ones every week. And certainly you've gotten emails or you've gotten notices of we were part of a compromise, we're going to offer you credit monitoring or we're, we're sorry this happened. Um, if, if people want in, they can get in. Uh, case in point with the most recent uh, national governmental security uh, breach. They got into the NSA, they got in the FBI, they got in the CIA, they got into uh, many, many, many places. If they want hard enough and you put enough effort towards it, they can get in. The goal is to not make it easy, right? Make it as hard as, to, as you can, especially as an individual. Um, so these hacks happen all the time. And if you put your email address in here to have I been pwned, it searches through the database. Let me go ahead and put my, my personal one in, which I'll, I'll share with you guys. Um, and you can see, oh no, that is part of, of hacks. And it goes through and it tells you which uh, hacks it was part of. So in 2000, or 2013, Adobe had a compromise. And you can look at the bottom here and they'll tell you what was compromised. And I will tell you the username and the password are the two key things you're looking for here, really password. Uh, because if your password was compromised here, if I used a password for Adobe logging in that I used anywhere else, that password is also compromised everywhere else. So if I used, you know, my, uh, if I used my dog's name is Jill as my password uh, in Adobe, and I find out that it's been part of a compromise here, anywhere else I use that password, my dog's name is Jill, now needs to be changed because I, it's out there. It's for sale. And literally, this is for sale for very few dollars uh, out on, on the dark web. I can go purchase lists of compromised passwords and stuff that's been compromised in the last day and validated compromises and stuff that hasn't changed. I can go buy this. It's very inexpensive to buy a list of these, very inexpensive to buy a program, and it's very inexpensive to spin it up on a laptop with some you know, VPNs and some hidden pieces so that I can just sit back and try to get into people's accounts with really kind of passively, you know, and, and inexpensively getting into that market. Uh, so if you come up here and you find out that your password that you use in Adobe has been compromised, then you need to make sure you change that password everywhere that you use it. So for instance, uh, and these are going to show up forever, right? Like you know, this was part of the Experian from the Exactus chain. So there's some fitness things here, right? So places that I put in my password, this one, for instance, this, this spam bot, they got my email address. I'm not terribly concerned about that. I'm probably not gonna change my email address because they got it, because I use that email address everywhere. It's if they have the email address, the username and the password, those are the things they, that you really wanna make sure. And then I would go through here and go, oh gosh, first off, I would change it for Adobe. Like for instance, I would change it for Adobe and then I would change it wherever else again. So at some point, uh, go do a little bit of surfing out here on have I been pwned, see if you've been a part of these compromises and if you use those passwords still uh, and you haven't changed them. We'll take this little break to just see if we have any questions or anything popped up in the chat. Oh, looks like we're clear, all right. And you're still on, so I haven't bored you to tears yet, so that's great. All right, go back to the presentation. So those are those two sites, security.org, how secure is my password and how I've been pwned. Um, again, these are trusted sites. These are ones where I'm not putting in my password along with my login, so that if I'm concerned it's tracking it, uh, 
make sure you go to these sites only. Don't go to some other because they could be a trick site, right? Trying to get you to put in your username and password. All right, we'll continue from here. So what are big no-nos? What are big password no-nos? And if you're doing any of these things at home uh, or your partner or anyone in your family is doing this, I need you to uh, give yourself a little slap for doing them. So are you using single dictionary words? So my password is password. Single can be found in the dictionary. Jill, single word could be found in the dictionary, right? Like stay away from that. Is it using less than eight characters, meaning, you know, Jill, J-I-L-L, -L, right, four, uh, not a good password. It needs to be a minimum of eight. You saw the complexity, uh, length beats complexity, so you want to go as many as possible uh, while still being able to remember it. Are you using a common phrase? So the example of my dog's name is Jill, you know, is it's not great, right, but it is a phrase. It makes sense. It's logical, and somebody could guess that. Um, my password is, you know, like Jill, my password is Jill at all your places is a common phrase that they use. So a lot of these common phrases, uh, let me in, uh, I forgot, right? These kind of things that uh, you want to stay away from. Um, also try to avoid personal words or dates in your passwords. So it, it is easy to hang your hat on, I know when my birthday is, I know when my, you know, family member's birthday is or the date. So I'm just gonna go ahead and put that as the number because it's a meaningful number to me and it's easy to remember. But it's easy to find out too. Like I can do a fairly simple Google search or look on Facebook or find out what year you were born, uh, what year your partner or spouse was born, if there's any special things about those dates. And I can go ahead and try those in those passwords because most of the time they're found in there. Uh, people will find it in their username all the time, right? Oh yeah, I need to put that in in the, the year I was born just to show it to me. Uh, try to avoid those if possible. And then here's a big one, using the same password in many places. So we talked about this with the Adobe. If I use the same password in Adobe and it gets compromised, it's compromised everywhere I use that. So using the same password in many places is, is difficult, it's a no-no because then the next question is, well, Bates, how am I gonna remember a different password for each one. Well, we'll get to that in just a second. Um, avoid common things, running numbers, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, you know, uh, QWERTY, Q -W -E -R -T -Y, the row of the keyboard, uh, the words password or you know, some sort of let me in, lock, something like that. Avoid those common ones because those are instantly found. And then of course, the one thing that I'm sure we've all done at some point is writing our passwords down on a sticky note or a piece of paper or in a book and putting it right there next to your computer. Uh, while that does help you, it is also difficult uh, to protect against, right? Anybody who goes, oh, I wonder what their password is. Oh, there's the sticky note right there. Oh, look, there's a sticky note right there. I can figure out exactly what it is. That's not one thing, but it's like something catching the screen. Looks like we have a Q&A. Let's go ahead and jump over there. Uh, so, uh, Jeannie says, what if I use the same base password, but alter it according to the CIDR account in a way I will remember? Jeannie, that's fantastic. So I'm going to get to that in just a second, uh, but that's, that's, you're right on it. That's exactly what we want to do. So let me, um, let me pin that for a second and I'll get back to you as we get to that slide. But I like your thinking. So here's, if, if there's bad things to do, here's good things to do. So what are good things to do? Uh, try to make it easy to remember. Obviously, that's gonna be difficult. You're gonna have to make it something that sticks in your head, uh, but hard for other people to guess, right? Like I was born in blank is not a good one because that can be easily sussed out. Uh, my, my dog's name is whatever, right? My kids are whatever. So it's gotta be easy for you to remember, but something that nobody else would really we want to try to keep them different for each login, and I'll get to that in just a second. Uh, you do want to mix, as I showed you, upper and lower case and symbols. The complexity helps grow it, um, but again, length beats complexity. So even if you don't say, I'm going to put zero symbols and zero uppercase, it's all going to be lowercase, then make it as long as humanly possible because it will take a while for people to guess that. Use a password manager, and I'll go over some examples of some password managers and one that I use. 
uh, to show you how to do it. And some you may have access to that you may not know that you have access to already. And that's a, that's a software, a tool that manages it for you that is not a uh, physical book that you um, leave uh, near your computer or a sticky note. And again, long is better, 16 or more is best. And you know, there's just a little anecdote that you want to use it like a toothbrush, right? You should choose a good password, you should choose a good toothbrush, you should not share it with anyone and you should change it on occasion. Uh, changing it on occasion can be uh, difficult, right? Because just as you remember it, now you have to go change it. If you uh, have some regular event every six months or your annual event, such as you know, changing the oil in the car or something that flags, not a birthday, but something that flags uh, when to do something that also goes, oh, it's time to you know, do my spring cleaning. Oh, it's time to change my passwords, uh, you're going to want to do that because they become compromised, they become stale, uh, and the longer you have them as one, the more likely they are to get compromised. So uh, again, I won't belabor this anymore, but my dog Rex, right, is Eric, eight character, lowercase, right, it's going to take, you know, there's 209 billion possible combination or, you know, ways to get to my dog Rex. Uh, but with a skilled attacker with multiple vent, you know, ways of getting to it, we can have that done in seconds. And of course, the strong password, you know, uppercase, lowercase numbers doesn't mean anything. It's just gibberish. And 16 will take for, you know, computer forever to crack. And no one's going to guess that. Uh, the problem being is you probably won't remember it, right? I wouldn't remember, oh, 2R53 and C. You know. uh, so, before we move into that section that uh, Jeannie was talking about. So here, here's a little game for you. Just which one of these is the stronger password? So if you look at uh, this password for me, which is using zeros, ones, threes, and at symbols versus password one, which one's the better one? Well, kind of obvious it's the harder one, right? Okay, uh, the second one, these two keys here, $2 for the slow boat with capitals at the beginning of each thing, complex sign, uh, Robert123. Again, I think you probably know enough now, right? That's the better one. Okay, how about let me in now, explanation mark, capital letters, lowercase, and then $1.7, my lucky number with three for the E. Okay. So those are all good examples of strong passwords. They're memorable, right? Password for me is a memorable thing. Uh, however, what you don't want to do is what we were talking about earlier is to have that be the same password for everything. So just as Jeannie was saying, what if I use the same base password and then make it you know, meaningful to me and then tack on something at the end? That is actually the, the, the best way to do this or like the best practice right now. Uh, so come up with a phrase you can remember. So for instance, I put, I am too smart for my own good, right? Just something that I can remember, I'm too smart for my own good. Uh, and use the first letters as the letters. So I right, am, and then numbers for the two, right? I am too smart for my own good. IA2S for MOG, no one would guess that, or at least it would be a while. It meets the eight minute minimum character uh, and it is not you know, easily guessed. But how do I make it different for each one? Well, then include the initial letters of the thing you're doing, right? So Chase Bank would be CB, uh, B of Bank of America, you know, BA, um, Facebook, FB, or something like that. So, so that there is some similarity, but then a little bit of complexity added. And rather than putting the qualifier at the end of the password, right? So password one, password two, and changing the end, uh, change the prompt. Right, it's less likely to be guessed if you change the prompt. So in this case, for Chase Bank, I am too smart for my own good would be capital C, capital B, I A, the number two, S four, M O G. So I am too smart for my own good. And if you were to put that in the, uh, if we went back to the password manager, you'd see that that would take several thousand years to crack. And then if that one's compromised, then you know, okay, Hold on, that one's that one's out, right? Uh, but I don't have that anywhere else unless you happen to stumble upon, uh, you know, one that also has initial CV. Um, and then 
what you can do is you could, uh, you, you would need to change it, right? Change the initials around if this were compromised, but you want to keep the same thing. So then you could keep, I am too smart for my own good when forced to change it. But instead of Chase Bank, you could have you know, uh, my bank or my Chase Bank. And by putting it at the front, uh, offsets the qualifier that says that is too similar to your last password. That often happens uh, because it's not beginning with the same letters. So putting me at the front helps you in forward compatibility. Uh, and also helps you maintain strong with lawful. Jeannie, I hope that answered your question because that's a good, good path to take. The other thing you could do that uh, could avoid any or you know, most complex passwords is sign up for two-factor authentication. So what two-factor authentication is, is I'm, I'm gonna guess you've all seen it if you're not even familiar with the word uh, two-factor authentication. Uh, when you log into a website, it will send you a text to your phone with a code that you have to input. Uh, it'll send an email with the special characters or a code to your email, and that'll plop, you know, like make you put that in. So it's two pieces of information. It's the password you have, and then it is a second form of communication, right? These are through text. And even if that's on the same phone you're putting the stuff in, it doesn't come in through the website, it's coming in through text uh, or through your email accounts coming through your email and you're having to look in there to find it. So two-factor authentication eliminates a lot of this complexity because you could have a simple password that you never change as your primary one simply because if a bad guy guesses your password to that site and they try to log in, all it's going to do is send a two-factor authentication to your device or to your email. Uh, and barring that they haven't gotten into your email, uh, then it's going to go ahead and block them from anything. So it could be a simple password they guess, but if they set a computer loose on it, trying to hack into it, uh, it's going to prompt your phone to get a text. And you're going to go, uh-oh, something's up here. I didn't ask for this, and I'm getting a text of alert, or I'm getting an email saying somebody's trying to access my account. Uh, let me go and verify that. So two-factor is what most places are moving to, most business places are moving to. Uh, you'll see it if you have any streaming services, uh, Hulu, Netflix, they'll, they've started using two-factor. Most banks, most financial institutions have a form of two-factor authentication that you need to sign up for. Um, it's free, it comes with the service, um, and you should sign up for that. So with all the fraud and all the dollars that are out there, um, the slight pain of having to go through a two-factor authentication every time I think offsets the loss of many thousands of dollars. Um, but it is hard to remember, right? Like here, here's a pie chart of the people who can't log into my account because I have a super hard security password and it's me, right? Like I can't remember my own password. Uh, so you're protecting against a very small risk, uh, but you're also blocking yourself out. So you wanna make sure you're remembering your password. Once you've come up with your phrase, once you've created uh, you know, something memorable and using numbers and symbols and you put the, the letters of the, the, the bank that it is, uh, signed up for two-factor authentication separately if you want. Um, how are you going to remember all of those? So it's, sometimes those won't work. Sometimes, you know, the complexity rules are different and they force you to change them. Well, one way to do it, right, would be write it down on a piece of paper and then just cross out the old one and write in the new one when it comes. However, that's really easily, you can leave that paper anywhere. Um, and you're most likely going to use it near something. So you're going to have it on you or you're going to leave it by a computer. Uh, so the next best step is to use a password manager. So uh, password managers are, you know, a digital place to store your passwords, right? So it's kind of like writing it down, but it's a digital and it's a secure place. And what you end up doing is creating one really secure password, one big one, that you use to get into the, the application, into the password manager. Then in the password manager, you get to fill out just like it's a contact where I said, you know, Mary Smith, and here's her telephone number. Uh, I put, you know, Chase Bank, here's the password. And that locks it off, it closes down. And then, it, you know, like the only people who have access to me is with me with that one super uh, difficult password. The, 
beautiful part about it is most of the time it's digital, right? So it either works on your mobile device or it works on iPad or it works on uh, your computer and they plug in. So as you go to the site you're going to, up pops, hey, I see you're trying to log in. You have this password in your master password in your password manager. Would you like me to go ahead and fill it in for you? And you say, well, yes, I would, thank you. And it's gonna say, okay, give me that one big password, your, your master password to get in. You put in the one master password that you have remembered and it reaches into that, pulls out the right credentials, throws it in there and logs you in. Uh, it's really convenient once you have it set up. Getting it set up takes time, right? This is gonna take effort and, and you going, logging in and adding all these, these uh, passwords. So it takes initial setup time. Most of them have a cost to them. I wouldn't go with anybody who's free because what's in it for them if they're not making money off of it? Are they taking your credentials? And then you still need to follow you know, good rules, but you have, to, you have to put a lot of trust right, in this company that you're hiring, hiring to protect all of your passwords. You're putting an awful lot of trust into them. Um, so here's a couple of good ones that uh, you know, have, have good track records, have proven uh, functionality and, and you know, are, are in it to really protect you, have proven that they have good ways of protecting your information. So Dashlane uh, is probably the most popular one there. In fact, the ones who make the site that we checked your password, that we checked our passwords on earlier, you're going to go to do it. Uh, Dashlane built that site, 1Password. Uh, great tool. It used to be called MasterPass, uh, but now it's 1Password. Keeper is a good one. LastPass, all four of those are good, but they cost. You're going to have to either buy the application or pay a subscription fee or pay a one-time chunk of money to have it. Um, do some research. Find one that you like. Look at the interface. See which one makes sense. Uh, and then typically when you buy one, right, so if you bought Dashlane, uh, you can then install that dash lane, right? You can log into that on uh, your computer, on your phone, on your iPad, on your spouse's device, and you can share, you know, your guys' shared passwords across that. So it's not typically one device uh, each costing. Uh, but this is a password manager, and that's a technical way uh, to store all the millions of passwords that you may run across. And uh, so let's see here. Uh, 10 rules for a safer password. So uh, this is just kind of the summary slide of some of the things. So use a different one for each site. This is in the best case scenario, right? Use a different one for each site. Change your password often and by often, uh, for instance, at work, we change ours every 90 days. Uh, however, that may not fit your schedule or your uh, desire to want to do it. So, uh, but, but do pick a time, right? Don't, don't leave the same one for years on end. Uh, they will get compromised. Uh, if you think you've been part of a compromise, then go in and change it. A simple note on the side, uh, a common phishing tactic, phishing, PH phishing, uh, is when they send emails, right? Trying to get information or get passwords or something like that. And you get an email saying, you know, hey, uh, this is the bank and we see that there's been fraudulent activity. Click this link or put your password in to see if it's it. Uh, never trust any of those. Take it as a caution and go, wait, wait, you know, is this real or is this phishing? Because the phishing ones look just as good as the real one. Uh, if you are suspicious that, that it's gonna be a hack or there might have been a compromise, never follow the links in the email. Go out, go to the website naturally, go log in how you normally log in. Don't follow their links um, and go see because that message will be there, right? This, I've seen this compromise, change your password here, or yours has been part of it. If there's nothing there, it's not obvious, it's not in your alerts section of when you log in, then the odds are that message was fraudulent or try, you know, a phishing email. So uh, don't follow the link. Don't take the word for it. Kind of assume all of the emails that come about banking or anything are suspicious. Take a second at least to think about it. Does this look real? Um, that is where we spend most of our time is educating staff here about fraudulent email, what looks real and what doesn't. And the people who get tripped up the most are, uh, you know, doing their best, right? They're not, they're not just clicking on everything. They actually thought about it and they said, oh, this sounds legit. And they clicked into it and found out that it wasn't. Uh, 
So it's really hard to tell the good guys from the bad guys. So just if you kind of assume they're all bad guys, you know, pessimistic point of view, don't adopt that in your regular life. But but for your email, assume assume that there's maybe some fraud there and, and go a different course. Go to the bank itself. Call the bank itself. If anyone calls, it goes for fat telephone calls too. Anytime somebody calls you, this is the bank calling you because you've got, you know, I need your password to get in. That's very commonly not the bank calling you. Um, so, okay, well, give me a number I can call you back at and, and make sure it's the main line of the company that when you call back, not just straight to the person. Whole another segment on, on phishing. <laughs> uh, make your security question hard to guess, right? Don't make it something that's really obvious. You go to your Facebook page and you see there's you and your, your white puppy, you know, your new puppy that you got. Um, and, you know, it's me and Samantha, you know, look at us how happy we are. Odds are your password has Samantha in it somewhere. So try not to, you know, try to avoid those, those common things. Uh, if a company offers extra security, such as two-factor authentication, or they use a uh, any sort of second factor email app uh, or or texting, sign up for it. It is it is worth its weight. That's how most of these things stop uh, proliferating. Uh, don't tell anyone your password. Now, of course, that you know, you're you're partner, your spouse, whoever you're with, right? That's, that's fine as long as you trust them. Maybe you don't. Uh, however, uh, don't give it out to, you know, like random people. Don't give it out to the kids. Don't give it out to, you know, like don't tell people over the phone. They shouldn't be asking you for your password. Um, if, if somebody calls you, you know, try to keep it as private as possible. Uh, again, don't use simple dictionary words. If you can, you know, spell them uniquely um, or use numbers instead of letters, use something that's, uh, or something really unique to you. Uh, again, length beats complexity every time. So as many characters as possible in your password is going to uh, keep those brute force attacks away. Uh, use a passphrase, right? So use, you know, like, like we said, um, I, you know, I am too smart for my own good is a phrase, right? That I can remember, but I'm not typing out. I am too smart for my own good. I'm using, uh, the letters there. Uh, and use a password manager. So any of those ones, I can't tell you one's better than another. Go go explore. There might be new ones out there that, that you like, but uh, aim for a password manager. So my myself, I use a password manager. I have it on all of my devices. Um, I have a remote login. I have one master password that gets me to everything. And then I follow a, a passphrase complexity uh, that I use the individual log in somehow into. So I'm following all of these rules and it takes effort. It takes time. It's, it takes brain power and space for you to do it. Um, but I'm protective of my goods. I know all of the evils that are out there, right? Uh, being close to IT, there's a lot of, uh, a lot of bad people trying to do a lot of things. Uh, so I, I protect them and I hope you take some of these, at least some of them, any step is the right step towards protecting yourself. And I guess we open it up if there's questions. I'll stop sharing. That was a that was a lot of yammering. If you have any questions for Bates, go ahead and type them into either the Q and A function or into the chat function, and I will read them aloud. Let's give everybody a minute just to get their typing done. Thanks, Marilyn. And Marilyn, will they have a chance? I mean, I can either give you this PowerPoint presentation. Will they have a chance to have those uh, the URLs to those two websites so they can check there? Yeah, when I just send out the follow up email for this event, um, I will include um, the actual links to those websites as well as um, the link to the recording for this event for folks so they can re-access it. Right. Um, we have a question, Bates. Uh, yeah. Someone is asking, does using a foreign language, say French, provide any additional security? So typically it doesn't. Um, uh, if your website, if the thing you're going into is not a international, uh, you know, it's a, it's a small local US based company and they only do business in the US, then there would be some security associated with that. But most companies are international and most dictionaries, um, the, the, the rainbow tables that they use to hack into stuff use common words in all of the primary languages. Now, if it was a 
uh, say really unique language. So French is you know, fairly common as a foreign language, right? But if you pick something really unique, uh, Swahili or Tagalog or you know something, odds are that that's probably you know better. Anything is better than you know password one. So any step you take, putting it in French, putting it in you know German or whatever is a step in the right place. However, uh, anything that can be found in a dictionary and of the primary language groups is uh, still fairly easily compromised. Okay, thank you. We have another question. Um, the question is regarding usernames. Um, do you use the same username on several accounts? That's a, that's a great idea. So some places automatically truncate you and say, well, I, uh, your username is your email address. Uh, and some of them are just the beginning to your email address, and some don't let you do that at all. Um, the, the same logic of putting your, uh, I am too smart for my own good, Chase Bank, could go to your username too. In fact, you would clearly know where a compromise came from if you started getting email to you know, the, the, the odd place. Uh, I, I won't get into it. Google uh, has a, a way that you can add usernames and hacks and have that still come to your email. So you'll know where it is by adding some special characters into it. I won't go into that right now, but uh, ideally uh, you would have a different username, different password for, for each of the things. That way if, right, so in the example of the Adobe compromise where I have my standard username that I use everywhere and the password is compromised and I'm using that password at multiple places, well then I've got to go change it at all those places. Having a different username is a great step in, a, in that path because if it's compromised, then those two pieces of the puzzle don't fit anywhere else. They can't go and put that username uh, in many places. So uh, ideally, yes. However, a lot of places handcuff you into your email address, your first part of your email address. Um, so you might not be able to do that for all, but if you can do anything, then again, step better than then the basic is, is a good right. idea. We have two more questions. Um, this person says that when she logs in, a pop-up comes up that says, would you like to add a username to the safe password? What is this? Good, that's great, great question. Let me jump over here to uh, share with you Chrome. Uh, so you, if you didn't want to get a password manager and you didn't want to pay the money or you didn't have the trust in a password manager, you have some built-in password management tools. Um, most browsers have that and it's asking you, would you like me to manage this password for you? And uh, most newer Android, if you're running Oreo operating system or newer on Android or an iPhone, have password management in it where it remembers it for you out of convenience. And I will show you here in Chrome. So if I go to Chrome uh, and I click on the, the little dot, dot, dot for safe settings here, I right, go into my settings, there's a section for passwords and, and Edge and Internet Explorer and Firefox all have the same general thing. It might be hidden in a different folder, but, but they have a section for password. And in here is basically a, you know, uh, password compromise, right? It's check, it's a, it's a password manager. It says, what website did you go to? What's the username you're using on it? And what password are you using? It blocks it by default, right? And you have to, if I wanted to see it, I would have to enter my master password, what I use to log in the computer. And it would show me. Uh, so it's kind of managing my passwords for me when it asks me. Um, the check password feature that's also in a part of Chrome uh, tells you, hey, I see that you're using uh, maybe a not the best password here. Or you're using passwords over and over and over again. It's kind of doing some of the work for you. Um, so this is built into Chrome. Uh, it's built into the new Microsoft Edge. Uh, it's on, uh, like I said, if in the settings section of your, your Android or your iPhone, there is a section of passwords and in those passwords, uh, it does the same thing. It lists out your passwords and then it asks you and it gives you a security recommendation of, hey, I see that you have an issue here that may have been part of a compromise or, so it kind of does the legwork for you. It all boils down to, do I want my computer? Do I trust this computer? Is it one that is used by multiple people or just me? 
uh, is that browser used by people I may not trust? So that's the first question, right? Is this like a public computer of a library? I would not have it remember my password. Um, if it's a common computer in an area that you use with many other people that aren't your immediate trusted family, I wouldn't do that. But if it is you, it's your computer, or it's you and your partner or whatever, uh, then yeah, you could use that. Too. But it comes down to trust. So just like Dashlane and OnePass and MasterPass, those you have to have a certain amount of like, all right, I'm trusting you to do to take care of this. Uh, the same thing goes for Google or Chrome or I'd like, all right, uh, Google, I'm, I'm sure hoping you don't have a hack and give away all of my stuff. So it depends on your level of trust. But it's a great tool. It does a lot of these pieces for you, uh, manages it and identifies when you need to change your password or when it's part of a compromise. Um, and you may be doing it and you don't know, right? You may have built up some that you're like, I've never used that. Go into settings and go into passwords and see if you have some that are remembered in there. Um, it's also a great way to go, what was my password? And go dig through there and see if you can find it. That's a very good question. All right, we have one more question. Um, Jordan is asking, um, her Mac does um, make its own passwords. Is this good or should she do it on her own? Yeah, so Mac has introduced and some other you know, companies have introduced this. I'm gonna create a password for you. Would you like me to make one up for you? And it's this big, long, complex, you know, gibberish thing that no one in their right mind would ever remember. Um, so Mac does that automatically as suggested password, your, your Apple phone does that. Um, again, it's great if you're putting your trust completely in them because they're going to make this obscure password and you're never going to remember what it is. Like if you ever have to log into your bank from not that device that's remembering it, you're never going to know what that password is. You'll have to do the reset. Um, so you're putting a lot of trust that you will always be accessing that website from uh, this device that's memorizing it for me. Uh, it's typically better to try to have something that you have control over. However, if you combine the, the uh, password manager tool where you're just remembering that one master password, I don't care what the rest of the passwords to all my everything else is, all I have to remember is that one master password, then by all means, make it as complex as possible because it's, you know, make it up for me. Heck, I don't even know it. I can't write it down. I can't give it to someone if they call because I don't even know what it is. Um, so there's there's all these tendrils of companies trying to improve security for you. And it's a balance between usability, right? Like trying to make it you know, secure and trying to make it something that you'll remember or be usable. So the automatic, well, can I remember this for you? The, can I create it for you? Uh, those are all companies tries at trying to do something to uh, help or stop this madness. Uh, same with the two-factor thing. So uh, it's a personal choice. Uh, it's up to you if you trust the, the utility. Great. All right. Do we have any more questions for Bates while we have him? Um, if you would like, you can enter them into the chat function or the Q&A function. Um, let's go ahead and we'll say two minutes. Two minutes to uh, enter your last questions. Oh, we already got one. Okay. Um, this person is saying when she enters her username um, and tap to the password line, a dot appears with the um, in the password line. Yep. Uh, so if I get this right, if I enter my username right at the top and then I tab over to the the line and a dot appears, uh, yeah, it'll it's now has identified that there's a character there. Um, a space, a, uh, a tab in this case, right? So what uh, what you want to do is make sure that there's there's nothing you didn't intend to put there. Leading, honestly, like that's, that's actually a really good thing is to lead with a space or a period or a, a tab or something like that because, you know, most people are not going to lead with that odd character in, in a password. So uh, sometimes it won't get accepted, you know, so sorry, this has to be like, you know, of the known characters, not a space. Uh, and sometimes putting a space at the beginning, like really is a great idea. Uh, but if you see a dot, uh, assume that it is, you know, like taken something you've entered and put it there. So I would get rid of it and make sure I know exactly what I'm putting into the password. Great, thank you. All right, um, I guess that concludes um, today's presentation. Thank you so much, Bates, for this incredibly informative uh, webinar. 
I will go ahead and send everyone um, a follow up to this with the recording and um, with additional links um, from Bates presentation. So thank you all again. Have a wonderful evening. Oh, we have one last question. Oh, just says thanks so much. Great info. Thank you, Bates. Really appreciate you taking the thank time. Thank you all. To do I, hope, for us. I, hope, uh, I hope you're all safe out there. Uh, appreciate you coming and attending. And of course, uh,